the word says, for the spirit of heaviness, put on the garment of praise. And that's how we fight our battles. Yeah. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. This is how I fight my battles. What we're doing tonight. This is how I fight my battles. It's when you think you're lost. It may look like I'm surrounded, but I'm surrounded by you. Hey. It may look like. I said this movement was invisible. This movement, you could not look at a building and say they meet here or meet there. But somehow, so in that regard, it was invisible. But its presence was felt among the people. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that great fear came upon the people. We have constructed lots of buildings and have made us visible. But I lament the fact that the presence of our government is not felt enough among the people. This is how we fight. This is how we fight our bed. This is how we fight our bed. This is how we fight our bed. This is how we fight our bad. 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 Somebody give God some praise. Can we shout hallelujah? Can we shout hallelujah? hallelujah? Don't allow your mass to mass your praise. Let's shout hallelujah. 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 presence of God is in this place. I'm going to start by, by sharing what will be like a light moment for you. But I don't want you to miss the essence of what I'm going to say after that. I'm going to share a story that some of you might have heard before. The story is told of a pastor in England who was feeling kind of low, but he knew that he had to minister in the evening. And as he struggled with that word, it started to snow like never before. And as it snowed, the enemy was saying to him, with this snow, nobody's going to come to church. And he started to feast a little bit on that thought of nobody coming to church. And as he sat there and pondered on that thought, the Spirit said to him, Church has been planned and announced for this evening. You need to go. And he got up and he went to church. And when he got to church, there was a single old man sitting in the assembly. And he looked and he pondered for a while. And he said, with all of the snow that I've just driven through, 
I've come and there's just one member here, faithful old guy. And church was supposed to begin, and as the time came, the time passed, and nobody else showed. And he walked up to that old guy and he said, since it's just yourself and myself, we're not going to have service this evening. I'm going to drive you back home. And the old man said to him, Pastor, if you woke up in the morning having a hundred sheep and 99 of them disappeared and there was just one, would you not feed that sheep? And the pastor stood and he looked at that man and he started to preach and preach like never before. And as he preached, he looked down and the old man was fast asleep. So he went to the old guy and he woke him. He said, after all of the thought you've given me about 100 sheep and 99 missing and feeding that one, you fell asleep? And the old guy looked at the pastor and he said, Pastor, if you had 100 sheep and 99 left, are you going to feed that one the feed you'll give 100? I want you to understand this. When the message is spoken, it is not about the buffet that's served. It is about what is for you. And I want you to commit to something today. You may not be like me, because there are times when I come to church and I feel heavy and I feel somebody has offended me. And when the word is preached, sometimes I stop and I say, you know, I wish that person was here to hear this word. But that's me. It might not be any of you. But I want you today to forget about everybody else who you believe this word might be for. And just focus on what is here for you. When the pastor reached out to me on Monday and said that he wanted me to speak today, I laughed. You may be seated. I said to the pastor, Pastor, I'm not surprised that you called. I am, however, surprised that you asked me to speak today. And the reason for that is last Sunday, after we'd finished assembly, I felt the Lord saying to me, I need you to speak. And I'd, I'd said to the Lord over and over, Lord, it's going to be a struggle for me to speak. I, I don't necessarily like to bring the word. Actually, the last time that I brought the word was in this capacity was a few years ago. A friend of mine who passes a Wesleyan church, and he said to me, my pulpit is open to come back, and I haven't been back to his church. Not necessarily because of that. <laughs> but I also felt Last Sunday, and especially as I drove home, the Lord was saying, the word from last week isn't just for today. It's a word for the season. It's a word for the season. So I want to build a little bit on last week. And this has been one of those weeks where, even though I knew what God wanted me to share, I struggled and a lot of it was, Lord, I need strength to bring this word. So I was, it was very much like you last week, Merlin. I'm going to ask you to just look with me. We're going to take a little bit of a journey first to build 
to what God has asked me, laid on my heart to share today. And we're going to do so as we looked at Revelations chapter 3. And for whatever reason, Revelations is not a book that I read often. So when this word came, I said, Lord, this must be you. And the reason unto the angel of the church in Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, and thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember therefore how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come on thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names even in Sardis which have not defiled their garments. And they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot out his name out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith, He that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth, and no man shutteth, and shutteth, and no man openeth. I know thy works. Behold, I have set before thee an open door, and no man shall shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and has kept my word, and has not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews, and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world, to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God. And he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God. And the name of the city of my God. Which is New Jerusalem. Which cometh down out of heaven from my God. And I will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. And unto the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works, that thou art neither hot, sorry, cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich, and increase with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched, and miserable, and poor, and blind, and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold, tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear and anoint their, thine eyes with eye slave, eye salve, sorry, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. 
Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him, I will sup with him, and he with me. To him that overcometh will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am set down with my father in his throne. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Spell your heads with me. Father God, we dedicate this time to you. Father, we sit in your presence, we stand in your presence, in awe of all that you have done. We stand and sit in your presence with grateful hearts, recognizing it's because of you that we are here. It's because of your grace and your mercy. So, Father, we ask even now that as we spend this time in your word, that you will speak to our hearts. Break up the fallow ground, Lord, that our hearts would be prepared, O God, for the seed to be sown, for your word to be established in our lives. Father, we give this time to you. We do not claim any of the glory. We give all the glory to you. Speak to us, Lord, in this hour. And may your will be done. May lives be changed and renewed in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. As I was sitting and trying to listen to God as he speak to me, I said, Lord, you know what? I'm going to have to write what you want me to share. Because otherwise, this is going to take me off course so far. I want to use the passage of scripture we've just read. And for those of you who are familiar with the seven churches, you know that the church at Philadelphia was almost a model church. However, what the Lord led me to focus on is the church at Sardis and Laodicea. And in verse 1 of this chapter, and we're going to build, I'm just going to build on this scripture to get to where we want to go. The Lord says, I know your reputation as an alive church, but you are dead. Speaking to the church at Sardis. The church at Sardis was urged to go back to what they had first heard and believed and get back to the basics of their faith. We're still speaking to the church at Sardis. You see, we need to understand that there will never be new truths that will contradict the word of God. Not as is written in the Bible. If somebody is telling you that they have a new truth, a new revelation, and it contradicts the word of God, ask yourself some questions. There will be revelations, there will be visions, but they will never contradict the word of God once they are from God. And let's establish that very early. We have to make sure that even if we have itching ears, we are able to decipher what comes from God and what is not from God. The church was also told to wake up. The church was so fast asleep, they were not even aware of what was going on around them. They had become so comfortable. You see, their wealth and their comfort had lulled them into this peaceful sleep where they were okay with what was happening around them once it wasn't affecting them. We're still talking about the church at Sardis, by the way. Their self-satisfaction had caused them to die spiritually. Remember, this is still the word to the church at Sardis. They not only wandered from the teachings of the apostle, but they were no longer growing in their faith and evangelism. 
Unity, love, and compassion had left them as it related to how they related to each other. Folks, remember we're talking about the church at Sardis. Nobody don't say that I'm talking about our church, huh? The scripture says they were clothed in white raiment. And white raiment really means to be set apart for God and to be pure. And as we read that scripture, that was what God desired of the church. This was still the church at Sardis. And as we read that scripture, Christ made some promises for the future to those who stood, who stood firm in the faith. Scripture talks about the key of David. And the key of David represents the authority to open the door of invitation into the future kingdom. And after that door is opened, no one can close it. Conversely, because salvation is assured. Conversely, once that door is closed, no one can open it. Judgment is certain. But when God spoke to the church at Laodicea, his tone was different to when he spoke to the church at Philadelphia. He had no compliments for the church at Laodicea. There was no affirmation of their faith or works because their lukewarmness was repulsive. Their self-satisfaction was unfounded and they had become complacent and far too comfortable with the status quo. This is church at Laodicea. The church was basically destroying itself. But Jesus still encouraged them. He was giving them an opportunity to repent. You see, when God disciplines, the purpose for discipline is not necessarily to punish. It is to bring his people back to him. As we reflect on the letters to the seven churches, you would notice that at the end of each of those letters to the churches, the believers were urged to listen and understand what was written to them. The messages, though different to each church, was for everyone. My question to you, having looked at those two churches, do you see any similarities with our churches today? If you can't say amen, you can say ouch. Jesus was standing at the door and knocking, imploring the church to open its fellowship to him, just as he did with the Laodicean church. But like them, oft times, we're too busy enjoying the worldly pleasures and not even noticing that he's trying to come in. These pleasures that we enjoy, these worldly pleasures, can be dangerous because they provide temporary satisfaction and it encourages an indifference to God's lasting satisfaction. Let's bring a little closer to home in terms of where we are. COVID-19 has served up an indifference to church, to God, and in some cases to prayer and to the Bible. Like me, I know that you have heard many believers boasting about the fact that they haven't gone back to church. That's the indifference we're talking about. But yet these believers are comfortable going back to work. They're comfortable going into the supermarket. They're comfortable socializing. That's the indifference that COVID has served up. And sadly, this is an indication that we've quietly started to shut God out. We need to leave the doors of our hearts open 
that God can just come in and dwell with us. Some of us has clo have closed the doors to our hearts, so he has to knock. The problem with that is if we don't recognize the knock, we're not going to open. So it's important that we leave the doors to our hearts open for God to come in. We have to allow God to walk right in. It's our only hope of life and its fullness. Look, none of us like to be rebuked. But as children of God, it is necessary for chastening at times. The distinguishing mark between those who grow into greater maturity is how we respond to the correction of God. And I'll tell you something else. I'm going to whisper this. It's almost impossible to grow spiritually without humility. We've got to learn to listen to God when it hurts. We've got to learn to respond to God even when it's hard to do so. The fact that God is still speaking to us today is confirmation that he still loves us, he's still interested in us, and he's still pursuing a relationship with us. But you see, there are lots of Christians, lots of believers, who only want to serve God in an advisory capacity. We are most comfortable when we are telling God what it is we want and how we want it done. It is time to take a step back. It's a time to stop and pursue God. Sit in the quiet and listen to God as he speaks to us. We're living in a time when we need to be discerning. And discernment begins with a solid foundation. I want to repeat that. Discernment begins with a solid foundation. The truth tellers of God need to be able to recognize falsehood. Have you ever been into a bank and you saw the telecounting cash and suddenly she stops or he stops and look at one note and start to inspect it? Comes from their consistently practicing so they know what a note feels and looks like. It's the same thing with us. If we don't practice reading the word of God and staying in prayer, it becomes difficult for us to understand and hear the voice of God. So in order for us to be discerning, we must have a relationship with the truth. And don't confuse fact with truth. You see, a fact is a thing that we know to be true, especially when there's some evidence available. However, a truth is a fact about something and rather than things that have been invented or guessed. It's a fact that we are all sitting here and I can see you present. But the truth is, even though I can't physically see him, I know that the Spirit of God is here. I want you to close your eyes for a minute. Do you see anything? No? Open your eyes. Do you see anything? If I were to title this message, it would be closed or open. What do you see?
You see, if we become confused about the gospel and the faith that we walk in and believe, it's because we sometimes allow our hearts and our minds to flirt with its rivals. I'm going to repeat that again. If we become confused about the gospel, the faith that we live by and believe, it may be because we allow our hearts and minds to flirt with its rivals. There are a lot, a lot of messages out there rivaling the word of God, the truth of God. And if we allow our spirits to flirt with them, we can easily be drawn away. And you see, sometimes, as hard as it is, we disguise and describe our subtle and sometimes simple deviations as an open mind in search of truth and spiritual fulfillment. When we start to drift away, we comfort ourselves with that thought. This is my pursuit. This is my having an open mind to finding the truth and spiritual fulfillment. And so many of us get lost on that journey. And very often, these deceptions that come from the enemy often spring from a desire to make God's truth and the Christian walk a little more easy to embrace. But these are also signs that we're not discerning we're not as discerning as we need to be. Look, I know the enemy is not always easy to recognize. He comes transformed as an angel of light. That's what 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen tells us. So he knows how to make his lies appealing and attractive based on where we are as individuals. The enemy is not going to shape a plan and come towards me in the area that I'm strong. So he knows that's a waste of time. However, that plan might be for somebody else who might be weaker in that area. So when the enemy schemes and plots, his plans are designed to attack me where I'm at my weakest. And that's why we need to be discerning. And that discernment comes from our depth in the word and in the truth. So let us not be drawn in by the bright lights and the smooth talk. There are a lot, a lot of people with a lot of smooth talk. A lot of pastors with a lot of smooth talk. It is not coincidental that this is where I am. I've seen a lot of the smooth talkers. And as hard as this is to accept, as hard as it is to say, there are many pastors who are really good talkers and who can wrench your heart and tear your heart into pieces to the extent that even when you don't have to give, you will give all that you have in your purse. Romans 16, 17 to 20. It reads, Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, Deceive the hearts of the simple. For your obedience has come abroad unto all men. I am glad, therefore, on your behalf. But yet, I would have you wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you.
believe me, it takes discernment and the grace of God to cover and to carry us sometimes. I'm happy that we are all awake. You see, for some people, making an impression defines their life. Sorry, let me, ch let me change that around a little bit. For some people, making a good impression defines their faith. This is sad, but it's also true, and it happens. Look, let's cut to the chase. The church is full of posers. People who aren't there for the love of God, but for the love of duty and influence. Church has become a network for some people. We've done a fantastic job over the decades, and I dare say centuries of making the one institution based on crucifixion and selflessness a place of power and status. Sorry. I know the word makes some people uncomfortable. It made me uncomfortable this week. All too often we conform to traditions ideals, and expectations of men rather than the image of Christ because men are more readily available to give their mark of approval. You see, for some of us, we haven't learned how to make his victory a part of our identity. Some of us continue to live defeated lives because we have not identified with the victory. You see, as children of God, we fight from victory, not for victory. So, it baffles me sometimes that we behave so often as if we are so defeated. We want to take a message of hope to people, but we're defeated and even in the way that we carry the message. I'll tell you something. Very, very often people would look at me and they will say, when, when we talk troubles, and people will say, Braff, don't worry, you don't got no problems. You don't, you don't have the kind of challenges that we do. But I want to tell you, I have my own challenges as well. But you know what? I've learned that every time that somebody says that to me, I say, Lord, thank you for making me look good, and I thank you for me making you look good. Because in my state, whether I am tried, where I am tested, and I look good to people, I am sending a strong message about what God is doing in this life of mine. You see, the enemy's attack isn't on us, you know. We get confused. It's not personal. The enemy's attack is on the kingdom of God that lives within us. It's not about you. This war is centered in the spirit realm. And I smile every time I hear the Minister of Health talks about COVID-19. And he says, we don't understand that we are in a war. He doesn't even understand that we are in a war, but it's a spiritual war. In embracing the trappings of this age, we seem set to lose the war of ages.
We've allowed the enemy in this spiritual battle to tempt us to live Christian lives that are fueled by externals rather by, than by the indwelling spirit of God. We have become so confused that we forget that the Holy Spirit is living within us and that's where our battles are fought. We start to take on the battles ourselves externally. And we neglect the spirit of God that's living within us. And I'll tell you a secret. For those of you who don't know. The enemy has influence over the externals. So when we start to battle with the externals. Understand that we are coming up against an enemy who have control and influence over a lot of the externals. If the enemy can get us to base our lives on these externals, he will keep us fruitless and he's going to keep us frustrated. Are you frustrated today? If you are carrying some frustrations, I suggest that you stop and ask if you are trying to take on a battle that wasn't meant for you. And if we start to understand this, and understand that this battle that we are fighting starts with a spirit that lives within us, the enemy doesn't stand a chance. You see, for those who desire to make a good impression, validation is critical. How important is validation to you? Or more precisely, how important is human validation to you? If we are operating on the realm that we are seeking validation from those around us, we need to stop. Pause. Our validation comes from the one who lives within us. And we don't have to seek validation. Once we are living and walking in the spirit of God, God is going to validate you step by step, minute by minute, hour by hour. You see, the Christian life is not religious activity. Or even just serving Jesus in the strength of our flesh. It's about Jesus working out his life in and through us. Plenty of churches and Christians mistake their own zeal for the power of the Holy Spirit. And while it is true that the Spirit still produces zeal, it doesn't mean that all zeal comes from the Holy Spirit. So be careful what you're zealous about. So never mistake zeal and activity as the essence of life in the Spirit. They are just byproducts. They're not the substance of the Holy Spirit. And too many of us as believers, we try to manufacture evidence of being alive when we are functioning in the Spirit. And the result of that leads to frustration and burnout. Because we're working so hard to impress. We're working so hard for people to see us in a particular light. Look, if you're walking and living in the Spirit, you don't have to try to put on anything. You don't have to waste energy. Just remember, we aren't just trying to live. We aren't just trying to live for Christ. He's actually living within us already. You see this war? The war brings on pressure. And none of us, I don't know anybody that likes pressure, but we all feel it at some point. 
And trust me, it can come from deadlines. It can come from family. It can come from friends. It can come from society at large. It can even come from TV commercials. So I know you're sitting down in your home and something comes up on the TV that you don't even need. But once you see that ad, it starts to hone in. And the next time you see that ad, it gets stronger and stronger. And eventually you tell yourself that you need it, you know. But that don't happen to some of you all. It's probably just me. Pressure is one of the enemy's most effective weapons to conform to something other than the image of Christ. Are you feeling pressured? What's the source of your pressure? What is the source of your pressure? And you see this pressure, this opposition that comes from the enemy in the form of pressure, this seeks to manipulate people when the stakes are high. You know, when the pressure is on, you are more tempted to do something to get out of that situation or to get past that than you would normally. I don't believe that any true believer wants to compromise his or her convictions. In Galatians 6, Paul had taught the church at Galatia one thing, but false teachers were filtrating. They were infiltrating using high-pressure tactics to teach another message. And Paul's letter to the church at Galatia was an example of a bold stance in the face of spiritual opposition. I don't know if you've been reading the press, the newspapers a lot recently, but we've had a few of them in the press recently. And one by our very own pastor and bishop. Our issues aren't exactly the same as the church in the first century Galatia, but the principles are the same. The devil has no new tricks. We don't only face contempt and opposition from outside of the church. We face pressure from those within the faith who diverge from the gospel in one sense or another and for one reason or another. And it usually has a lot to do with self and is wrapped up in the glossary of the word. I've had the opportunity to sit and listen to a speaker that was brought in from the US some years ago um, at the assembly that I was in. And I sat and I listened carefully as the believers were cheering and they were shouting their hallelujahs and their amens. And I watched how he manipulated the word to get across a message with verses that were never intended to support what he was preaching. And we've got a lot of those still. I remember calling my pastor the Monday morning and I said, Rev, I had some real issues last night, I struggled. And he asked me with what? And when I started this year, and I highlighted a couple of the verses and how they were misused. He smiled, told me he recognized. And I said to him, so are you going to speak to your church about what happened on Sunday night? Or are you just going to leave them to go with what was, what was said? And I got a chuckle. Needless to say that that word that night was ungiven. That word was ungiven. And given ridiculously. 
So that message wasn't going to be touched. Be careful, saints of God. As God breathes his will and his plan into the church, those who aren't sensitive or connected to the spirit aren't able to focus on the new creation. They will often miss what counts. And that's why I started where I started today. I don't want you to miss what counts for you. As Paul did back then, I want to point you back to your first love and the true gospel of salvation. We're reminded that a great cloud of witnesses traveled this path before us. And many of those trailblazers of faith suffered great hardship. They overcame enormous odds on their journey. We've got examples that we can follow. So there's no reason why we can't accomplish the same. And we need to remind ourselves of this. Because in our trials and tribulations, we can become introspective. We can become focused on what's going on with ourselves. And we can turn to self-pity. And I remember Brother Merlin last week saying, oh, you asked the question, why me? Why not me? And this can lead us to a sense of futility. We can feel insulated and far removed from the encouragement of the spirit and from other believers. And if we add our own acute awareness of the sin that sometimes exists in our lives, we will find ourselves floundering and deep in frustration. Because we can manage to convince ourselves that we have become so bad that there's no way out for us. And the enemy loves to play that trick. And we feel really trapped by the circumstances and sin. But you know the truth is, we aren't trapped, you know. When Christ died on the cross, he died for our sins. Don't allow the enemy to trick you into believing that your sins have to have you in bondage. I know there are some people who behave like they don't sin at all. But you don't look at them. Look to God and remember your faith, your salvation experience. The fact that he died to set us free from our sins. You see, our burdens are no match for God. And faith sees the reality of this truth. I want to repeat that. Our burdens are no match for God. And faith sees the reality of this truth. Faith sees the reality that our burdens are no match for God. In John 16 and 33... You said, I have said these things to you, that in me, you may have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. And what we need to do is to upgrade our conviction to match our destiny. If we are walking on a road and we don't know exactly where we're going, we're lost. We're still lost. So we must know our destiny, our destination. And we've got to upgrade our conviction to match that. Don't focus on what's happening. Let's focus on what's coming. And greater is coming. Greater is coming. 
You see, some of us haven't been trained in CPR, but we are very proficient in CPR because we are continuing to try to breathe life into situations that God has already considered dead. You see, if we are hanging around dead and we're still crying over what God has already declared dead, we are going to be in a constant state of mourning. And some of us have been in a state of mourning for a long time. And once the worms and the maggots start to eat away at that which is dead, it starts to give a stench. And you see, if you are hanging around that stench, you're going to start to carry the smell of death. And when that smell of death attaches itself to us, life seems to be at a standstill. We start to lack enthusiasm. We start to lack faith. We start to lack hope. We become hopeless. There's no peace. Everything seems to trouble us. We lose our purpose, our joy, and our fulfillment. And it's simply because we're focusing on what's dead and we've given up on what's alive. Jesus has left the grave a long time ago to live so that we can live. We serve a risen Savior. So why are we holding on to things that are not alive? The truth is, some of us are nothing more than walking cadavers because life has been sucked from us. The life of the spirit has been sucked from us. So we are nothing more than cadavers. And if I use a, a, a Bajan term, we are nothing more than duppies because some people might not know what cadavers are. Look, we have to understand what God is saying to us. Some of it is going to be hard, but we've got to trust God when it's hard. And God is saying to some of us, we need to close the door on some relationships. We need to close the door on some personal pursuits. We need to close the door on some friendships. And some time decaying projects. We got some things occupying a lot of our time that taking us nowhere. And we need to close the door on some of those things. Look, I know you may say that's easier said than done. But we trust a, we serve a God that we can trust. And God can separate friendships peacefully and beautifully. There are some people who I've been close friends with for years. And they didn't add value to my walk. And you know what? You pray about them and suddenly you realize that you drift apart. You're still friends. Because when you see you, you talk. But they don't operate in that circle no more. Because they were not serving a purpose in the walk. And that's what God is saying. That some of us need to separate beautifully with some of them. And I tell you, there are some friends that we keep friendships with that make us so tired. They drain us, they suck our energy. But yet we find it hard to separate ourselves from them. You know what it is to be traveling with dead weight? With some of the friendships and relationships are nothing more than dead weight. And you want me to explain to you why? You will walk into a room with our friend. You walk in light. You start talking. And by the time you just start to walk, you feel it heavier. It's like you've got weights on your feet. When you start with the weights, it feels, it feels all right. But the more steps you take, the heavier it becomes. And some of the friendships and relationships are like that.
God is asking that we have the doors of our hearts open. But you know, some of us are standing in our doorway with the, with the door open. And we're preventing, we are preventing entry because it doesn't look like what we want. It doesn't look like what we want. So we're standing in the doorway and we're watching it. And as it passes, that can't be it because that don't fit the description I have. And while we're standing in the doorway, something that's not meant for us, but looks like it fit the description. And we open it wide and tell it to come inside. We have to be discerning. We need to go back to our first love. We need to reassess our values, and this is going to require enormous revision. We need to stop trying to fulfill ourselves with people, with possessions and positions, and place our emotional and eternal investment in something that is more enduring and secure. You see, while those who are steeped in the ways of the world run around after toys and properties, acquiring and consuming, because that brings them fulfillment, and it's because they can't seem to find anywhere else or anything else that brings them that satisfaction. But you know what? we can stand back and let them do it. You may ask me why. And that's because we know that a life will never have true or full fulfillment unless Christ is in the center of our lives. Those who chase after the toys, the fancy cars, and all the other stuff, and homes, and positions, it's like a dog chasing its tail. Just spinning around in a circle. It's like a donkey has a carrot dangling a foot away from it and it keeps going at it and it remains a foot away. It's an endless chase that will never satisfy. Our chase is satisfied in Jesus Christ. John 10.10 10 tells us, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. But I am come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Some of us are holding on to past issues. We find it hard to let go. Some of us are holding on to present issues. We're struggling to release them. We shouldn't be living defeated lives like we have no hope. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. You see, we cannot live a life zealously for Jesus while living as a victim of our circumstance. Our circumstance doesn't define us. The depth of our relationship with Christ defines us. What doors have God closed that you're trying to open? What doors have God opened? that you're trying to close. Open or close, what do you see?
With eyes that are open, we can see. With eyes that are closed, that are led by God, we can still see. Open or close, what do you see? And God confuses the enemy, you know. Acts chapter 5. I'm going to show you a simple analogy as I, as I close. Verse 19 reads, But the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go, stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. And 22 reads, But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, the prison truly found we shut with all safety and the keepers standing without before the doors. And when we had opened, we found no man within. What I want you to understand here is that the prison doors remain closed. But there was nobody inside. And there will be times when people, based on their knowledge of who you were, will be looking inside and behind closed doors for you when God has already brought you out. And you notice that they came out and they went to deliver the word in the temple. God brought them out because God had a plan. And the plan was not for them. The plan was for those in the temple who would hear the word of God. And I'm going to draw another analogy for you. Acts 16. 26 and 27. Listen to this and listen very carefully. And suddenly, there was a great earthquake. So that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately, all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had fled. Do you all see what's happened here? The doors were locked before, and nobody was inside. The doors are open now. But everybody inside. I tell you, God has confused the enemy. And just as the word was for those in the temple, this time the word was for the prison guard and his family. This wasn't about Paul and Silas. And I'm telling you, many of us as Christians and as Bajans too, once that door burst open, we said, Yes, this is the Lord. The Lord send this open for me to get out. And we were to charge. But Paul, because of his connection with God, knew that this open door was for the jailer and his family, not for him and the other prisoners. We can trust God in every circumstance. We need to be discerning to the spirit and voice of God so that we can be obedient and walk in our victory. The enemy's tactics are superficial scare tactics. Satan can create all kinds of situational havoc, but he cannot disturb the spirit within us. If that's where the spirit dwells. If we are immersed in the spirit of God, the difference between a five-star hotel and a Greek jail is so minimal that like Paul and Silas did, you can sing praises in either. We have, as believers, to learn to worship God in dark places. We have to learn, as believers, to worship God in dark places. My dark place may not be your dark place. My challenge may not be your challenge. But whatever that dark place is, whatever that challenge is for you, we've got to learn to worship God in those dark places. Galatians 3, 
verses 2 to 5. This only what I learn of you. Receive ye the Spirit by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith. Are ye so foolish, having begun in the Spirit? Are you now made perfect by the flesh? Have ye suffered so many things in vain, if it be yet in vain? He therefore that ministereth to, the spirit, to you the Spirit, and worketh miracles upon you, doeth he it by the works of the law, or by the hearing of faith? The question is, Having come this far by faith, are you going to surrender your walk now to trust the flesh? Or are you going to continue to walk in faith? The scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, we walk by faith and not by sight. Understand why I talked about the closing of the eyes and the opening of the eyes. We walk by faith and not by what we physically can see. And the scripture also tells us in Romans 10 and 17 that this faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. My question to you open or closed? What do you see? Open or closed, what do you see? The Spirit of God dwells within us, whether open or closed. Whether opened or closed, what we see is the Spirit of God leading us where he wants us to be. If you're not at the place where you can say with assurance today that I'm trusting the indwelling spirit of God living inside of me to lead me, to help me to make my decisions. If I'm not at a place where I can respond when God knocks and recognize that he is knocking or that he is speaking. I want to challenge you today to take some time to reflect and to ask God to renew your faith. I want to encourage you to go back to your salvation experience I want to encourage you to go back to that simple faith. The word tells us we have faith as much as a mustard seed. Let us place ourselves in a position that whether open or closed, what we see is the spirit of almighty God. God bless you. This is how we find our battle. This is how we find our battle.